Hello and welcome to Crack Your Science course. This workshop is presented by the College of DuPage Tutoring Services. I'm Leah, a professional tutor. And I'm Jane, another professional tutor. The goal of this workshop is to better prepare you for your upcoming science course. We're going to start this workshop off with a review of good academic habits to foster your success as a science student. A question you need to consider when committing to a class is how much time you should spend studying outside of class. I ask my students this question every term and many times I hear, I don't know, a few hours, to which I answer with. You should expect to spend three to four hours outside of class per credit hour. Most courses that include a laboratory are four or five credit hours, resulting in a range of 12 to 20 hours that need to be spent outside of class. Of course, there's some wiggle room with this rule, but it generally will hold true for all science courses. Maybe you're particularly strong in this subject. You've taken a similar course semi-recently that shaves off maybe one or two hours a week. On the flip side, maybe you know that this is a subject you're not strong in. You may find yourself needing more than that upper range of 20 hours. You will find what works best for you. These hours are a catch-all for any activity related to your course, other than time spent in class or in lab. This includes time to complete assignments, reading, working on projects, and preparing for exams. You are better off overestimating time necessary for your studies than underestimating to ensure you don't fall behind. Have you ever bought the required $200 textbook but didn't use it? Even if you don't have assigned readings from the book, it will benefit you to read it. Sometimes professors will say that they don't require you to buy a textbook, but if you find yourself wanting to read up on a topic prior to class, look for open source texts or try places like Half Price Books for older copies. The library may also have older editions available for checkout. Even if the textbook is not the edition used at the college or even written by the same authors, it still contains valuable information. Why use a textbook when you constantly have the internet available at the tips of your fingers? Well, textbooks can provide key terms and concepts with context to your course that search engines may not provide. Also be wary with internet sources. With a textbook, you can trust what you read. To get a better idea of what will be covered in your lecture and to take an active role in learning, we recommend priming your textbook. Priming is a fancy way of saying reading your textbook before you come to class. Open up the chapter and ask yourself, what are some areas of interest on this first page? Note if there is a key concepts area and an overview section. Key concepts or learning objectives will give you a brief overview of what you'll co cover in the chapter. Use these to guide your readings. After reading the section, make sure you can answer any concept check questions. While reading, a good rule of thumb is to pay attention to diagrams. Do not over-highlight. Use the summary at the end of chapters if you are unsure of the most important information. Something I personally have found useful is lightly underlining what I think is important in pencil and then going back to see what I underlined and highlighting the most important aspects. When you are in a class that uses a lot of equations, such as physics or chemistry, the textbook is handy since it will define the variables in each equation and provide the values for the relevant constants. If you happen to miss cl a class or did not mark down the variables in your lecture notes, the textbook will clear up those equations for you. In addition, textbooks provide reference values. This is especially useful in chemistry classes. Values from the internet may or may not be correct or may be rounded differently than what needs to be used in your homework. If your professor does not give you a list of reference values, it is better to use those provided in the textbook. An important but overlooked question that every successful student should consider is, what does self-advocacy mean to you? As a college science student, it is your responsibility to create an open line of communication between your professor and yourself. Simply introduce yourself at the beginning of the semester, before or after class. Take advantage of a professor's office hours if your schedule allows. Office hours are an ideal place for you and the professor to get to know each other better. Review exams, discuss your grades, and get extra clarification during office hours. If your professor doesn't have office hours, check your syllabus to find the best way to contact them. Professors are more inclined to write letters of recommendation when they personally know a student. Get to know your peers. Introduce yourself the first week of classes. Exchange numbers if you're comfortable. 
Collaborative learning with your peers can be a great way to check your knowledge and prepare for exams. It is important to remain independent of your peers to a degree because at the end of the day, you are responsible for your own work and grade. Self-advocacy includes using your best judgment when using internet sources. Check the internet material against what is covered in your lecture or textbook and always check with your professor to see what sources they allow. For example, many professors will not allow Wikipedia as a cited source. And finally, it's okay to not know everything. Seek out help if you're struggling. Come to the Learning Commons where you can get some extra help from a tutor. Now, let's discuss how to crack your chemistry class. In chemistry, you most likely will not get an equation sheet, so it is vital to know which equations you must memorize for the exam or quiz. The equations presented in lecture are obviously important to know, but there may be others that are necessary. So while doing the homework, note which equations you used on a separate piece of paper. Combine these with the equations presented in lecture to form a list to memorize. Don't write up your lab report right before it is due. Do it as soon as possible after your lab while you still remember the small details that you may not have written down. For example, you spilled some of your solution or not all the solution was transferred. Your professor's pre-lecture will also be fresher in your mind. Chemistry not only requires a conceptual understanding of the topics, but also memorization. You will need to memorize equations or the list of strong acids and bases. If you don't know already, experiment with different memorization techniques to find which one works the best for you. Flashcards are a popular option, as is Quizlet but some people like to write out what they need to memorize multiple times on a piece of paper. Drawing out a mind map may prove beneficial for you. Your professor may require you to use a scientific calculator instead of a graphing calculator. This is often the case in chemistry classes. Perhaps you've only really used your phone as a calculator. If you are not familiar with the calculator you will use on quizzes and exams, look through its instructions or ask someone to help you understand how to input the numbers and use specific functions, as these vary with all calculators. When in class or working through the homework, only use the calculator that is allowed on the exam. I have worked with students who had set the problems up correctly but did not give the correct answer due to not knowing the order of operations the calculator required. Exponents and powers of 10 are the area that most often trip up students. Don't view homework as an annoying time sink or as just an opportunity to get points. Use it for your benefit. Underline key terms and summarize what the homework situation is and what equations were used. Do not forget to write out all the units. By writing out the units in your calculations, you will better understand how the different variables work together. This also checks to make sure you get the correct final unit based on what the problem asks for. Never underestimate the importance of practice. Work through the textbook examples and extra problems. Practicing these problems gets you more familiar with what situations require what equations and the necessary steps to work through to get to the answer. Then, when you are taking your exam, you will be able to interpret the problems more quickly. Instead of cramming the night before or a couple hours before your exam, it is helpful to continually review the materials as they are learned. This can be looking over your lecture notes, the PowerPoint slides, any textbook summaries, or the homework you have completed. This can be done while waiting in the classroom before lecture begins or when you have an hour break between classes. Even 15 minutes a day will make a difference. Your exam is only a couple days away. Like I just mentioned, it's better to review continuously, but let's delve deeper into how you can actually review and study for your exam. Condensing your lecture notes with the slides in the textbook into your own study guides is a useful way to prepare for your exams and review the material. Once these are written up, they can be reviewed multiple times before you take the exam. Color coding your study guides may also help your brain group concepts and remember the details better. To check your comprehension of the concepts, try explaining these concepts to your peers or work through problems in a study group. 
Determine if study groups are beneficial methods of studying for you or if you prefer studying with just another person or on your own. Everyone has their own preference, so don't feel bad if you have to say no to classmates. First and foremost, you look out for yourself. Brain dumping or info dumping is also a technique you can use on your exams. When you first get the exam, take a few minutes or so and write down equations that you had just memorized or seen. Relationships between concepts, such as if x goes up, y goes down. This can be used as a reference during the exam and allows the brain to relax. Also, it can be useful to practice this info dumping before the exam to determine how quickly you can do it and what you should dump. So though we get to the exam in panic because we're not sure how to tackle the problems, take a deep breath and don't panic. Move on to a question you can answer and then go back to that troublesome problem. Read the problem and underline keywords and constants given. Know what the problem is asking for as a final answer. Look at the equations or recall equations that contain these variables. If you are looking for helpful sources, these are some websites I recommend. Chemistry Libre Text is my go-to website if I want to review a chemistry topic. The site is rather hard to navigate if you are looking for a particular topic, so I usually include Libre Text in my Google search. Their explanations range from basic to in-depth, so it is useful for any chemistry level. This site also includes worksheets if you want more practice problems. Libertex is not limited to just chemistry, so I recommend exploring all it has to offer. Purdue also has a website that gives an overview of general chemistry concepts. Though this site has not been updated in a while, the information is organized well and the explanations are clear. It also points you to other websites that may prove useful. Wolfram allows you to click on different topics of chemistry, for example, inorganic chemistry, and then shows a list of topics. Choosing the different topics gives you definitions and charts that may clarify some of the concepts you are learning, or at least provide you with a nice summary of what is happening. ChemGuide is nicely organized into the different branches of chemistry as well as the basic concepts, such as atomic structure and bonding. There are many helpful summaries on this website if you ever need to review a concept or for clarification. Many of the students I tutor swear by either Khan Academy or YouTube videos. If you learn best by hearing or watching the concepts explained, definitely check their wide range of videos out. Other resources included with your College of DuPage tuition are access to tutoring services and the Learning Commons. Tutoring Services offers different modes of academic support. This includes appointment-based tutoring where students can schedule one-time or standing appointments. Students can receive up to three 50-minute sessions per week. Each session can accommodate up to three students in the same subject, meaning you can sign up with your peers. To request tutoring, students must fill out the tutoring request form on the College of DuPage's Tutoring Services webpage. Strategic success sessions are appointments available when a tutor is not available in your requested subject. Strategic success sessions are focused on organization and other critical skills where the tutor cooperatively learns with the student. Drop-in tutoring is available in a variety of subjects during the fall and spring terms. No appointment is necessary, and you can attend as much as you like during the available hours is generally available multiple times a week in each subject offered. At Math Assistance, you can receive help in your math or physics class in 15-minute increments. While you may need to wait your turn during busy times, you have an unlimited number of times in which you can have a 15-minute slot. Writing, reading, speech assistance, known as WORSA, can help you with lab reports or presentations. Good luck with your science course!